Hello and welcome to Tools in the Shed, a podcast powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that has caught our eye this week. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James, and with me, a managing editor, head of video, Matt. Today. And a key contributor of ours, Steve. Hello. I love Matt's title. Ah, this, <laughs> it's long. <laughs> this week, we're looking at Mitsubishi's Rally Art performance brand set to rise like a fiery Ute Phoenix from the performance car Ashes. Um, we'll discuss a trio of recent entries to the Cars Guide Garage, and we'll catch up with a fallen crypto warrior in this week's Musk Watch. Um, YouTubers, you can jump ahead courtesy of the time codes in the notes below, and you can click on the chapter markers in the timeline. So let's go. But but first of all, we're going to talk about an amazing combination, Triton and Rally Art. Our very own uh, Chesto uh, wrote a story that's created a lot of interest this week. A fast, tough ute, Mitsubishi, on how the new Triton Rally Art will take Australia by storm. So obviously, utes are the big deal. Um, they're the top selling vehicles in the country. Performance utes are becoming even more of a big deal. We've got Raptor, we've got everybody in there uh, and their dog wanting to be in market with something a bit special ute-wise. And here comes Mitsubishi out of the clouds. Um, and, and the way in which Rally Arts Resurrection was announced um, was almost a, a, a little sideline um, on a financial results announcement. What do you make of it, Matt Campbell, the, the whole Rally Art comeback thing? I think it's um, about time. <laughs> I think Mitsubishi's been, um, I guess, just sort of floundering a little bit in terms of uh, desirability. Like they're, they're a brand that uh, is known for reliability, affordability, um, but desirability is something that hasn't been part of that mix for a while, I don't think. Um, and I think the Triton's probably the perfect uh, point to jump from. Um, obviously, like you say, the dual cab ute market is insane. There's so many options out there for different customers who want different types of utes. Um, uh, typically, the Triton has played that sort of, uh, it's the cheap mainstream ute. It's always been the cheap mainstream ute. But um, lots of gear to go with it. Like it's, exactly. it's always been pretty well equipped for the money, good value. Yep. 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 And long warranty, uh, the longest warranty in the market, in fact, in Australia. Um, and so I think that there's, uh, there's probably uh, a growing number of customers out there who will have been going to dealerships and going, yeah, 60K for a ute's okay, but where's the 75K one? You know, like, and <laughs> it's crazy to think that that's a thing, but with um, some of the tax uh, incentives for customers now, um, you know, if you are an, a business owner, you might be able to write off a, a bigger, more expensive ute pretty easily. So yeah. um, you might be looking for a ute that you don't actually need, which uh, is, you know, that's obviously an Australia specific thing. But yeah. there are a lot of customers out there who are, who are spending, you know, 75, 80, $100,000 on a dual cab ute. Um, yeah. And it just seems that this is the right step, I think. What do you reckon, Steve? Can you imagine shopping for anything else like that? Have you? That's nice. But if you've got something more expensive, I could have a look at <laughs> That's right. right. Most people shop, is it? Yeah. And I agree. Like the thing about Mitsubishi, it's become more a bland than a brand. I um, mm -hmm. I remember I was on the road last week and I saw a Rally Art uh, Evo Lancer and I thought, God, it used to be fun. It's like mm -hmm. seeing comedians right. who's just gone out of out of flavour. It used to be fun. Right. And um, I remember when they when they did away with all that, thinking, Well, what have you got? If you take that away, what have you got? You've just got uh, reliability and you know trust in your brand but where's the where's the halo and car companies always talk about having a halo car. Yeah. you want to have something yeah and out like mazda has mx5 it doesn't matter if everything they make is a bit you know run of the mill friend, family friendly whatever as long as you've got one thing in the showroom that's exciting that drags people to that brand well, that's well, it. well toyota was often criticized as the ultimate manufacturer of white goods and and they yeah. you know akio toyota said we're going to have gr and that we're going to make exciting cars it's the same deal that 86 at least you had correct. 86 correct there's yeah. always something toyota is so big they can kind of get away with it but they've always had something exciting there or thereabouts you know in the past or whatever but it's like mitsubishi just let that go and i thought yep. at the time it was a really strange thing to do and they're like oh we're just going to be all about green and fev and hybrid and so on i was like yes. oh, okay that's nice but just have one thing just have yes. one thing that makes you exciting so bringing back rally arts fantastic well, you know, yeah, got heritage. Sorry. It's yeah, heritage, so. I, it's so true. It's surprising in a couple of ways. Um, the whole 
where Mitsubishi sits in the alliance with Renault and Nissan, it felt like it was very much the junior partner and there wouldn't be a lot of leeway for it to do as it wanted to do. So that's it's a good thing that they've been able to say, yep, we want to do rally art and have our own personality because it, it just, as an outsider, felt like a lot of stuff was being pushed on them. Yeah. And the performance you think, when you think historically, there's always this sweet spot where young people are staying at home. They're probably in their first job. They're doing pretty well. They've got a lot of disposable income and some of them decide to go and spend it on a car. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as they step out of home, <clears throat> all that changes. Um, but now this is the perfect convergence because you've got young tradies um, who are possibly in that situation. They want to spend all their dough on a really flash car and it ends up being a dual cab view. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's different um, though, isn't it? Like it used to be an SS Commodore Ute. Used to be that's a it. sports coupe. Yeah. And this, this is a very different kind of a, well, I was always thinking that the Ute term is slightly misused. I think of Ute as that kind of thing. But right. um, but yeah, it's a, it's a different thing. When I think about Triton being sporty, I go, okay. It that, yeah. actually strikes me as, well, that's that's an interesting move. That's that's making a that's making a very different kind of vehicle. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's sort of, um, to me, like, I, like you say, JC, with the, um, with the Alliance, uh, and where Mitsubishi sits in that alliance. I think it's kind of interesting uh, in Australia, for instance, we're getting the Outlander before mm. Nissan's getting the X-Trail or Renault's getting the new Colios. So it's kind of like Mitsubishi here might be taking a little bit more precedence because it does have a pretty big market share for such a small brand yeah. um, and for a pretty limited range of models as well. Yes. But like... Uh, you know, I don't see them going, all right, well, we're going to do rally art on everything. I can't no. see a, a rally no. art mirage um, no. anytime <laughs> soon. Which um, is a shame. I don't want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, um, like you say, you know, there is heritage with cars with Mitsubishi rally art, like the the Magna um, oh. and, and oh, the, yeah. the 380 was one as well, wasn't it? It was. So the Magna 2002 yep. um, and, you know, the figures now seem laughable for a performance sedan you know 180 kilowatts mm. um but but that was the number the 380 rally art was supercharged yeah um and it took that up to to 230 but it, it, it remained a front wheel drive car yeah there were going to be 20 built in the end there were 15 so <laughs> I, I don't i don't think it was an enormous um generator of revenue for mitsubishi yeah. which was on its way um out the door as a local manufacturer um anyway but of course, the, the biggest piece of rally art heritage is the, the whole motorsport program, particularly rallying with the Lancer. And there were Lancer rally art models as well, which were separate to the Evo thing. So mm -hmm. it's like two streams under the one umbrella. Um, Evo happened in these rally art models as well. So, yeah, it's, it's well known. There's a fair bit of equity in that brand yep. out there. So it seems sensible uh, to bring it back. And, and Chester makes the point that um, some time ago that, trademark was registered in Australia and uh, Mitsubishi is taking the vehicle, what had they used? The Absolute, which was a, um, a concept ute um, a few years ago. And we've, for people watching on YouTube, we've got a few pics of that. And even now that looks pretty good. So if yeah. it ends up um, cosmetically looking like that one, it'll, it'll have a lot um, going for it. Yeah. I think, um, you know, those established players that don't move quickly are at risk of uh, falling prey to the newcomers like the, the Great Wall Cannon Ute, um, yep. the GWM Ute as it's known, um, yep. which, you know, they've shown a uh, concept version of that. I can't remember what it's called. It's called like the Vap the Viper Taipan or something. It's, it's nice. Some Viper crazy. Taipan, I hope so. The Viper it's a Taipan. snake. It's a crazy to twine together. It's a crazy name, whatever it is. <laughs> okay, um, but it's it's gone the full, um, you know, bolt every accessory onto this new style. Yeah, um, and that's what you know. That's what people are really looking for. And you know, if if there's a if there's a potential for a um, an Mitsubishi Triton rally art, I yeah. I can't see it failing. I I you know I even if it's seventy grand, you know, like there's going to yeah. be still people out there who have had Triton after Triton after Triton, and they're willing to spend that kind of money on yep. that sort of vehicle. And someone will walk well, in and say, have you got a more expensive one? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, the other, the other thing is Chesto uh, recalled a comment by Seiji Watanabe, who is Mitsubishi's head of design, and he'd previously told us, Cars Guide, uh, that he wants to build a super performance SUV. Um, so that seems like a perfect entree into uh, a kind of farewell to Pajero or, or some kind of special 
uh, finale with Rally Art playing a part there as well. Crazy to think that there's um, the, these brands that, uh, you know, relatively small have these massive aspirations um, to have performance programs where the bean counters are probably going, yeah, but we'll just actually just do a body kit, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. But that's the enthusiast running the asylum, isn't it? It's yeah. like it's a Toyota going, why, why do we need this GIR? So, but look, I think how much fun it'll be. Like, yes. Why not? Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, the outlook and and you know if we're up in that kind of money um, realm, uh, mm-hmm. another kind of interesting announcement through the week in terms of Utes, and this one is more of the, your your large scale, is the new Ram fifteen hundred. Um, Matt, it's been a long time coming. I know Chester had a drive of it in the states pre COVID, mm-hmm. um, so we've had a little bit of experience with it. But it's a it's a slicker looking proposition than than the classic fifteen hundred. Yeah, um, that we've had for some time. It looks pretty neat to me. Yeah, it's um it's it's big. It's uh, square. It's mm. um, a V eight. You know, like it's what people uh, will yeah. aspire to own. Um, yeah. This one, obviously. New generation, it's called the DT. So if you ever see uh, DT Ram 1500 or Ram 1500 DT, that's what they're referring to. The old one was yep. referred to as the DS. All um, right. So uh, this one, you know, 5.7 litre V8, um, yep, yep, 291 kilowatts and 556 newton metres. That's nothing unusual for the Ram 1500. Um, Eight-speed auto, uh, all-wheel drive, um, four and a half ton towing. Ton towing, absolutely. Yeah. Massive, but this one has cylinder deactivation tech, engine start stop, and forty eight volt mild hybrid. Yes. Um. So it only uses twelve point two liters per one hundred kilometers. Oh, the um, old hybrid's working there, isn't it? Oh yeah. <laughs> um, but the I guess the um you know for us as as cars guide we have a pretty strong focus on safety technology. Um, and the old car doesn't have basically any of the active safety tech where this one introduces a bunch of active safety technology which is basically i guess it's the price you have to pay to play in this market these right. days um, especially yeah. if you're charging uh hundred and fifteen thousand dollars for the base yes. model, um, yeah and 140 for the top spec so there's, and there's going to be more. Like there's going to be um, new versions after this special editions that push the price even further up. Now, one one memo that I've missed is whether or not this car supersedes the classic model that we've had, or as in the states, they continue to sell alongside one another. Do either of you guys know what the, the story is there? The word is that they will continue side by side. Side by side. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's, one. Mm-hmm. yeah, the price differential would be the thing there, I suppose. Yep. So the $80,000 $80, drive away was what it launched at. Um, yep. I'm not sure whether it's still at that, but I, I think that there's um, potential for it to kick along for a while there because like you say, JC, they're, they're building them still side by side um, and they will continue to for a while because it's sort okay. of, you know, they've made the money on it. Just keep yeah. making more money <laughs> on it. You know? That's I right. Just, uh, I just love that you called it the slick, the, the new one slick. I'm trying oh, to picture I'm... someone making an elephant look slick. <laughs> like how can anything that big? That's doable. I mean, all things are possible. I, I guess so. Given you the know what's right... not possible? Driving that car where I live. I had it for a week and I couldn't park. I had to sleep in it. I just had kept driving it round and round, went and parked in an oval. So that's the only place I could actually park it. Good luck reverse parking that thing anywhere. Yeah. Oh, look, I reckon given the right vets and cosmetic surgeons, I could make an elephant slick. And <laughs> I, I, I'm just talking comparatively, I suppose. Comparatively this new one slick. just looks yes. a, little, a little more contemporary. Don't right. at us, Peter. Uh, we're not interested. <laughs> no, no, no. But um, also, Senior Bob will love it because it's a big petrol-powered Hemi, and uh, that's what he wants in everything. So <laughs> that's uh, that's very interesting. Uh, it'd be good to get people's thoughts on Rally Art. Any experiences that you've had with Rally Art models? Uh, what you think about that brand relative to, you know, GR for Toyota, the Raptor with Ford, and um, the the various things Nissan and uh, others are up to? Uh, it'd be great to get your thoughts. But um, I think uh, we'll move on to our garage. And Steve, you've you've been you've one upped um, you know everybody is an understatement with the car that you have been driving recently. Please fill us in. Yes, I did have the uh, Ferrari Roma this week, which I had a lot of trouble. People often say, "Is it is it difficult to drive Ferraris?" And uh, you know, as long as you don't touch the throttle, just treat the throttle like a sleeping tiger. Everything tends to be fine. But I had trouble driving it because I couldn't stop looking at it. 
I just, uh, I'm, I'm putting it out there for me in the flesh. It is the most beautiful car I've ever seen. Oh, and a lot of people wow. came up and said, is okay. it a, is it an Aston? Is it a Jag? It, ha- it has little bits of everything. And yet I just think it's so, you know, not, you know, nothing is perfect, but it's very close to it in terms of the, uh, at least the exterior. I, I so love you, it. you were doing the looking, you. you were looking in the shop window type thing um, oh, as well, you were I, in traffic. Yes, looking at the shop window. No, no, I just couldn't get into the car in the first place. I just stood <laughs> wow. with the dealer for a long time, walking ah, around it and um, great, dabbing great, my great. eyes. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, great. And then when you get in it, it's quite beautiful inside. But I had I had a moment of uh, mild panic because everything in it's gone electric. It's got this vast curved TFT screen. The Manatino, which has always been a mechanical thing, is now digital. So oh, you turn wow. it, it all lights up on the dash. The, even the start button is now like a, it's always been a very much a physical thing. Now it's like yeah. an electric sensor with your thumb and all of that is going to break because it's a Ferrari. <laughs> but, um, you know, good luck to the owners, I say. And if it breaks, it won't matter because you can just look at it. Now, wow. where, where does this fit in terms of what does it replace and where is it in the kind of pantheon of, of Ferrari-ness? Well, it doesn't replace the Portofino, so you can still get that, but it is slightly cheaper. So it's now a, the entry level barely 400 you know thousand dollar ferrari realistically 600 once you put like mine didn't have apple carplay because that's optional um so realistically yeah i think it's a six thousand dollar option i'm actually but it's several thousand dollars for carplay in a ferrari so i didn't have that and (laughs) um so it's very much an entry-level ferrari but in the past entry-level ferraris have been a bit poo and right. um, and they're not really so much about the driving, but the mm. kind of thing that Ferrari will say, if you want to buy a V12 Ferrari, you have to buy two V8s first. So you want to uh. buy one of these and buy something else kind of thing while you're waiting for the, for the super fast. Yes. So it's very much an entry level, but it is, it is much better to drive than any other entry level they've done before. It actually feels like a real, you know, it's, I wouldn't have one over an F8, but it has that Ferrari-ness to it that's, you know, that's exciting. The, the option thing confirms my theory that you reach a tipping point where the more expensive, expensive the options are, the better. Well, Because right. uh, you can basically boast about, you know, yes. see that paint? 15 grand, mate. 15 yeah. grand. You know, yeah. it, it, it becomes... Well, I had $60,000 paint. $60,000 paint. There you go. That's just bragging rights. It is like $180,000 of uh, options. I think the last Ferrari I had, not this one, but um, $180,000 of options is not out of the question, which does make sense to me because if you could buy one, you are sort of, you are, I think, the kind of ruthless businessman who doesn't like to be ripped off. Oh, yes. Yet, oh, that's a good alternative. Point. That's you true. Do. Yeah, yeah, so that's, yeah, that yeah, never that's makes sense to me. I know the bragging thing, but even so, it's like you're telling people, yeah, they really nailed me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a good point. Very good point. So, what, what is the, uh, the engine and where is it located? Uh, so the, it's the typical V8, the V8 from the um, from the F8, but detuned, and it's in the front. So uh, ah. it, it is it is a vastly uh, huge nosed thing. So mm. it does feel kind of very differently balanced to a mid engine Ferrari, but uh, got that kind of forward thrust that you get in a in a V12 ah. you know, yeah. front engine thing. But yeah, it's magnificent, fantastic. And you street parked it, of course. Uh, <laughs> I street parked it six feet from the gutter. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Just in the okay, middle of the road, well, so people can look at it. <laughs> wonderful. Because I care. Wonderful. Wonderful experience. Now, uh, Matt, yes. thank you, Steve. Um, you've been in a different part of the automotive world. Oh, yeah. Uh, but it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's exciting in a different way. Please, please tell us about your wheels from this week. Yeah, so I've been spending a bit of time in the Kia Nero. Uh, now, if you're not aware of what the Kia Nero is, it's the brand's first... Uh, I guess, entry into electrification in Australia. Um, And it's a a delayed entry because the Miro has been around since uh, late 16 or 17. uh, And it's now uh, mid 2021. Um, And quite um, openly, Kia Australia said in the press conference that this car is at the end of its life cycle. Um, So, you know, we're getting it very late. um, And it's fair to say, that it looks like a 2017 Kia design. Uh, The brand has come a long way over those years. Um, You have a look at it compared to a a Sorento, for example, and we all know um, the Sorento's caught plenty of people's eyes because it is a stunning looking SUV. Um, And even the Carnival, you know, these are vastly different designs to the Nero, um, which to me sort of looks like a cross between um, the Rio that's still on sale and 
I guess, an old sportage. Um, right. But the, it's not about the looks. Um, that's the important thing about this car. It's about the yeah. three power. That's, that's how I live my life, by the way. <laughs> and that's why I, I try and convince people of that every day. It's how my wife shops. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, like I said, it's the entry for Kia into electrification, but it's not just on one front. So it's got a hybrid, it's got a plug-in hybrid, and it's got a full yep. electric. So yep. it's like the Hyundai Ioniq, Ioniq. in that yep. regard, um, but it's in a small SUV body shape, which is what people want. And unlike the Ioniq, it's got the big battery pack for the full EV model. So yes. the 64 kilowatt hour battery, which is smaller than like a Tesla, um, but it still offers you a claimed 455 Ks of range right. um, because, for the EV. Sorry, just to, just to jump in there, Matt, that was the big head scratcher with Ionic, wasn't it? That it was the choice of powertrain that, that people really wanted in a body style that people didn't want so much. Yeah. So to, to, to put it in the SUV seems so much more of the times. Yeah. And I think that um, they probably regret the decision to make it a, a sedan style thing for the global market. But in in markets like Korea, where the sedan style is yep. still gotcha. so popular, and yeah. even America, um, mm. then Ionic itself was was a pretty good success story. In Australia, right. you barely see them. Um, yeah. And, yeah. you know, if they were an SUV, uh, like the next, uh, the Ionic 5 is sort of a midsize SUV, but sort of a hatchback thing. And the Kia EV6, again, same sort of thing. Um, they they will have that appeal. And I think that's the thing with the Nero is that it does have the level of, this is the size and type of car that a lot of people are shopping for right now. Um, it's just a shame that, you know, you, you're buying a car that's quite expensive. Um, mm. You know, the mm. top spec one, uh, top spec electric is $71,000 drive away um, yep. for a car that's, you know, five years old, maybe six. Um, it doesn't have heated seats. Uh, it doesn't have cooled seats like the the um, yeah. Kona Electric has those things. Yes, um, it's only got a part digital and media. Then, screen. As we were saying, Matt, you know, in an electric car, heating things is so easy. You know, it's yeah. just yeah, just run that wire up to the it's seats and keep it going. Bang! Yeah. It it, yeah. it happens. It's a very easy thing to do. And there's some other questionable, I guess, inclusions on the lower grades or the different powertrains like the, so there's HEV hybrid, uh, PHEV plug-in hybrid and EV, yeah, EV. Yep. Um, yep. So the, the HEV and PHEV both have a turnkey ignition um, mm. in the base grade. Unusual. Um, and wow. halogen headlights. I know people yeah. hate me going on about halogen That's headlights. retro. Geez. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, this is an electrified car in 2021 and we're coming out with shortcomings like that. It sort of uh, took me by surprise, took a lot of journalists that I've spoken to about the car by surprise. Um, mm. But, you know, kudos to Kia for finally jumping in the, the green space. Um, and this is just a stepping stone. I think this is the most important stepping stone for Kia in Australia mm. because, you know, you will have EV six coming soon um in the yep. next 12 months um, and there'll yep. be a new nero after this and you can expect the new nero to be a more efficient b more affordable c better equipped and yeah. b with better safety credentials as well so and yeah. i suppose full, it's, it's a, sorry James, sorry go ahead full regen thing i just uh, i got out of the ferrari into a leaf e plus and uh, i've been driving around with an e pedal on yes oh. one pedal driving uh yeah. which i find uh, unusual does it do yeah. that kind of adjustable regen thing it can yeah um so some of the models have the paddle shifters so you can adjust the um i guess the aggression of the braking system mm. um and yeah the the ev models you can do full one pedal driving so it'll come to a complete stop so um uh, and i mean depending on how your car sickness tolerance is <laughs> um then maybe just check with your passengers before you try that because uh -huh. it can be pretty like whoa. The, the e pedal, the e pedal in the E plus is aggressive, mm -hmm. um, and you really have to drive through it um, to get going. And as soon as you release it, it's like yeah, the the yoke has been released and you and you roll off into the sunset. Yeah. But boy, when you turn it on, you you feel like you're fighting against it the whole time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and the I biggest challenge is to try and try and reverse park with the e pedal on. Oh. 
Because you can't. You have to push the car with the throttle to go backwards. Yeah. And, and as soon as you get off the throttle, even slightly, you just stop. It'll stop. Yeah. It's very <laughs> tricky. That's, it's that's fun odd. to watch, but yeah, uh, I, would, very I wouldn't recommend trying. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it's a bit. This it reminds me of Ionic too, Matt. In that Hyundai brought that car to Australia towards the end of its life, but it was almost a mark of enthusiasm, or you know, we we want to land this idea that that we're a brand that can produce these vehicles. And I'm sure, as you say, Kia is trying to do the same thing. This is a this is a turning point for us, and and making a statement in that way. I think they're preparing yeah. for a time sixty years from now when Australians start to take EV seriously. <laughs> yes Probably. some some you know australians very close to our national capital yes uh, yeah, yeah 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 all right well thank you matt um i will uh wrap it up on the garage with another kia um the carnival and the one i've been driving is the platinum so the top of the tree in diesel uh the 2.2 liter turbo four cylinder 148 kilowatts but 440 newton meters which is a pretty uh healthy dose of torque from just 1750 RPM, it's available. Eight-speed auto, front-wheel drive, just under $67,000 before you put it on the road. And there's so much uh, to like about this car. Um, it's The layout is terrific. You know, Kia has so much experience now with this people mover thing through several generations of Carnival that they've really fine-tuned it. And there are so many thoughtful little touches in terms of the design. It also rides very well. It's had that Australian suspension tuning. And it's, it's very, very good in terms yeah. of its compliance and ride quality. Um, it's spacious, it's an eight-seater um, and very talky. I think it looks good. Yeah. Um, you've got air conditioning and connectivity and storage everywhere. So it is totally focused on families and convenience for you know, transporting that number of people. Um, it's got that trademark enormous boot. The depth of it is just ridiculous. You can yeah. fit so much stuff in there without changing any of the seating. Um, what else? Seven year warranty, lots of safety, um, big slick screen up the front. There's that word again, slick. Um, 12 point, 12 point Screens can be slick, James. It's fine. <laughs> but the, the, the back doors slide, which is really nice and, and great when you're in tight parking because it's a pretty um, substantial vehicle. And I do yeah. like the driver's intercom that allows the driver to speak more specifically with people in the second and third rows, like you kids. <laughs> just you know pull your head in and shut up or we're going home you know like you put stuff. the emperor voice on me do they have to it do is. The emperor, <laughs> i think Luke, that's a, that's a really good yes. <laughs> stop it <laughs> or it's all going out the window i love um, that button i think it's fantastic it's fantastic but the the, the only real downsides i could think is you've got to sign on for a vehicle that's about 5.1 meters long it's pretty big so just practical things like you've got to make sure it fits properly in your garage or wherever you park it or, or whatever. It's not exactly an inner city type uh, proposition because it's a big vehicle. You've got a close to 12 meter turning circle. Um, so it, it's large in that sense. Um, the only other thing, this is the platinum. Uh, you don't get leather, you get a, a, an artificial leather, which is probably better. I don't know, probably more practical over time, but if that's a thing for you, it, it's not there. Yeah. And also just from a kind of philosophical point of view, it's a people mover. And you've got to be you've got to oh. be ready, I suppose, to just say, "Yep, that's that's the life I'm living." But I'm, James, I'm gonna, you made that decision when you had the fifth kid. Yeah. I'm gonna, that's it. I'm going to have a people mover but because James, right. we just have to. Yeah, mate. It, it's not. It's a GUV. Oh, it's a grand utility vehicle. If you yeah. ask Kia Australia, I'm calling um, it a PM. Is it it's their, a people is it their billboard? Is it their billboard? This is the Australia's first GUV. GUV. Yes. Yeah. Grand uh, utility vehicle. I've yeah. been yeah. dying to find out what that stands for. Yeah. All right. Um, well, and I was just going to say, if um, if you're in the market for a carnival, make sure you watch our comparison test with the uh, Kia Carnival and the Hyundai Palisade eight seater SUV and the right. Mercedes Valente eight seater. So um, the unifying thought being eight seats and different yep. ways of getting there. Yeah, and all about the same money. So kind yep. of kind of an interesting comparo. If you haven't watched it yet, be sure to give it a look. Yeah. So I, I really like the vehicle. I think it's uh, a very successful execution. It's just psychologically, you've got to be ready to put your hand up and say, I'm going to buy a people mover. Oh, I said they managed to make it look van. good. Yeah. A van. Yeah. You said you managed to make it look good, James. Do you think it actually looks good? I do. I do. I do. I mean, that's an achievement. You've got a lot of sheet metal to deal with. It is a, a large piece of real estate, but the, the, the face of it particularly has that more contemporary Kia look to it. Um, and they've integrated it very nicely across a large palette. Um, so I'm gonna I, be, think, I think I'm they've gonna, done a good job. 
I'm going to be controversial and say it's not as good looking as the last one. That's my oh, take. That is right. controversial. Controversial. Yeah. I know. I know. I've got a mate yeah. who owns the current, well, the last one. Yeah, I yeah. like it more. And how many so. kids oh, well. does your mate have? Four. <laughs> Only four. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so there's room for friends as well, or family. Oh, there's room to expand. Room to expand. <laughs> room to expand. My goodness. Does he know how this is happening? Has he worked out? Yeah. I think he has. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, that's fair enough, I suppose. I just think that that latest treatment, a very sparkly grill, and all of these little touches, maybe it 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 ages rapidly. But I think at the moment it looks pretty good. Um, that's just me, and it shows how subjective those kind of things are. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Well, that's that, and we will move on to some feedback from from last week's episode. And last week. Um, we were talking about, it was Chesto, Byron and myself, and we were talking about the Nissan Patrol Nismo mm -hmm. um, as just this proposition for a petrol-powered um, large four-wheel drive SUV. And one of the things we did raise was maybe that petrol power poses problems when you're in more remote areas um, of this country anyway. And Eddie Fuentes says, um, look, no problems with unleaded petrol in remote outback. Gardening equipment, generators, quads, motorcycles, they all run on unleaded. Um, these patrols can run on regular unleaded as well. Uh, and the best thing about fueling up in the outback is no lineups uh, compared to lots of caravanners in their diesel cars. So <laughs> Eddie enjoys just watching the big queue of diesel people, probably at the one or two Bowsers, um, while all the petrol ones are free. Yeah. Um, so that's something. There's He obviously either lives or spends time um, in more remote areas and, yeah, no problem getting fuel. Yeah. Um, Hammer Rocks, he makes an interesting point. The Nissan Patrol is another example that ugly cars do not sell well. <laughs> the Patrol Y62 Series 1 to 4 didn't sell well because, in my opinion, it had a face and rear end only a drunk designer could love. Oh. But the oh. better looking Series 5, and with a little help from COVID, sales are at an all time high for the Y62. Plus, the sound of its V8 exhaust doesn't hurt either. So he's just saying that tweaking it from a looks point of view over time has improved it where, you know, people have put it on their shopping list because it looks a bit better. Has he had a facelift too? Yeah. Might have. Might have. <laughs> mm, yeah. Might have. I know Hammer lives a hard hard life and uh, he, he may have had a nip tuck just to keep him. <laughs> I think it appeals to if you like in American the game. things. It's a very American looking thing, I think. Yeah. You reckon? It's like an American family truck kind of thing. Well, that's true. And it is called, I forget its name in the States, but it's um it's oh. large. Is what? it Armada? So, Armada, that's the Armada one. Thank you. Family. Armada. Um, yes, the invading Armada. Um, to the capital. Into <laughs> <laughs> yes. Maybe it would have been helpful on that day. Um, anyway, uh, that's Hammer's, Hammer's view. And just on a more general note, Grudlin74 said that he can't unsee Mr. Pritchard's pants from last week. And he was actually wearing a pair of Celine Dion pants. Oh. And with that uh, great singer's face imprinted very boldly, across the pants and the crotch area apexed at a particularly awkward spot. So I think oh, I said be, Celine Dion pants, I thought they'd be no. really, really tight so that he has to no. squeal. No, they weren't they weren't her pants and oh. they weren't really tight. They just uh, were emblazoned with her visage. Right. Gotcha. Um, oh, Senior Bob, uh, at the beginning of last week's program, we called out Elon as Wario on uh, Saturday Night Live at the beginning of the show. And Senior looked up and saw what he calls, his words, not mine, Byron the Greek. Um, <laughs> he thinks Byron has a touch of the Super Mario about him. Uh, to quote Senior, go Byron, good mo, mate. Um, and Byron does have a magnificent moustache. Yes. Um, right but it shouldn't be encouraged. Well, do you, do you not think so? Well, mo, I don't know. His face it, grow, uh, it grows in roughly half a day. You know, yeah. he, 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 he does shave it off his back before you know it. Um, <laughs> And then Stuart Marler, we were talking again about Elon on Saturday Night Live, the most unlikely combination. Um, and we were talking about the monologue where it was Mother's Day and his mother, May, came on stage and all of that. And Stuart says he checked out Elon's SNL monologue. How can we trust this guy to give us level five autonomy when he couldn't avoid that car crash? Um, which was I thought, a very good line. Zinger. A very good line. And, um, you know, that leads us beautifully into this week's episode of Musquatch. Right, so first of all, um, there's been just a cryptnado 
of activity around cryptocurrencies and the deer leader has been in the thick of it. Um, and Gizmodo reports that there are this, uh, it's a crypto investors scheme to gain control of Tesla um, as Bitcoin markets tank. So Bitcoin has crashed this week by roughly 50%, and it's not alone. Ethereum, Litecoin, even the initially joke Dogecoin are also, quote, in the toilet. Um, this came six days after Elon tweeted that Tesla will suspend Bitcoin payments, and we touched on that last week, uh, for its cars due to the fact that mining expands massive, expands mass, uh, massive amounts of fossil fuel. Um, now a band of traders has decided to form the People's Coin, appropriately named Stop Elon to stop Elon Musk from wielding intractable control over the market with his tweets. And they're quoted as saying, there's no doubt that a prominent hustler is messing around with an immense following of unsophisticated traders with little apparent concern. Mm -hmm. So the plan is the road to fucking Pluto is what they're calling it, <laughs> to, se to sell enough stop Elon, to buy enough Tesla stock to gain significant voting power to, according to the site's blueprint, take full control of Tesla. Wow. So if you want to buy into Stop Elon, it'll be available shortly. I think they're <laughs> trying to buy the wrong thing. I think they should buy Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> That's not a bad idea. If you want That's to stop it, idea. buy Twitter. Yeah. It's It'll be around the drinks to buy Twitter. Ban somebody else. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> the, look, the other thing that caught my eye this week was um, reported by ESPN. Uh, UFC fighter Benil Dariush uh, gets Tesla loner after calling out CEO Elon Musk. So uh, this person's UFC lightweight. Uh, he waited months for a Tesla for Tesla to give him some answers about a new vehicle he'd ordered in 2020. As it turns out, all he needed to do was call out Elon Musk on live television to get the response he was looking for. Oh. Um, Dariush, 32, defeated Tony Ferguson via unanimous decision at UFC 262 last weekend in Houston and made a surprise call out of the Tesla CEO immediately afterward. Later that evening, Musk apologised to Dariush in a post on social media, which of course was Twitter. And on Tuesday, Dariush's manager, Ali Abadaziz, uh, posted a picture of Dariush standing next to a Tesla. Um, I said jokingly that I'd call out Elon uh, after my fight. But as I got close to the fight, I said, you know what? I'm actually going to call him out. It's been <laughs> frustrating. I've been waiting for months. Um, and he, he woke up on Sunday to text messages from multiple Tesla dealerships around his home asking him to return their calls. I'll, I'm like, I think I'm getting scammed. Then I hear about how Elon replied to my call out. We've called them back and they said to just come in and they'd get it all fixed up. I was like, that's it? Just come in? I've been calling you guys for months. <laughs> <laughs> According to Darius, Tesla informed him that his car is finished but still doesn't have a delivery date. Um, yeah, which sounds highly plausible. Mm. In the meantime, the company hooked the professional fighter up with a loaner vehicle. And there's a shot of him with his uh, Tesla 3 for people, uh, Model 3, people watching on uh, YouTube. Is so a real USC fighter? Because his name sounds a little ordinary. Shouldn't he be called the snake or a viper, oh, right. like his a ring viper serpent? Or yeah, I don't know. And I don't know what his walk-on music is either. Although that, was... might, that might be professional wrestling rather than UFC, actually. He, he knocked out Tony Ferguson. Isn't Tony Ferguson some kind of weight loss guru in Australia who runs a bunch of chemists? Well, he no also in fights ring. in the octagon. No Maybe the he does. Too, too skinny for the ring. <laughs> loves a good cage fight. Loves his, watches his diet and loves a good cage fight. But he should stop ringing these dealers and just turn up. He's obviously quite frightening. Just go yeah, in. That's it. You'll get that's a it. straight well, away. Well, he's got the full cauliflower ears. He's obviously got a good ground game. You know, he's got the uh, the, the wrestling part of his his act uh, down pat. Yes. And the interesting part is yet again, this has been weeks on end. The Tesla share price is down. It's down another twenty six odd dollars. Um, it's five hundred and eighty nine dollars eighty nine. And according to IG.com. Tesla's share price dips. Bury reveals $500 million short on the automaker. So Michael Bury was in The Big Short, uh, the movie The Big Short. And on Monday, he revealed that his firm, Scion Asset Management, had a $534 million short on Tesla. Um, and Bury has been critical of Tesla for some time. In December 2020, he compared the electric automaker to Radio Corporation of America, RCA, an infamous technology stock of the 1930s, which saw its share price rise spectacularly in value before crashing in an equally spectacular fashion. Um, since January, the Tesla share price has fallen 20.96%. So, you know, 21% year to date and last trading at 576. We've got it at five, uh, uh, 563. 
uh, well off its 52-week high of $900.40 per share. So this trend down continues for yet another week. And so the short sellers are, are coming out of the woodwork again, um, thinking that after all this time and all of that huge spike in the share price value, they, they're possibly going to get a payday. Mm. There's been plenty of people shorting it for a long time. Oh, yeah. 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 Do you reckon it's uh, those in the know going, well, he can fiddle with the cryptocurrencies as much as we want, but the, the real stock game is you know, yeah. a different one? Well, I think it's what we were, the, the point that was raised earlier is that people are waking up as to, yeah. as to what the underlying fundamentals of this whole business are. Yeah. Um, and the car company hasn't made money. It's been, you know, selling off, say, off um, set credits or net more recently investing in cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. So that seems a very volatile and unsustainable way of conducting a business. But the market has just ignored the fundamentals of that brand. For, forever. forever like if they yeah. suddenly if you suddenly had a look at the bottom line if you think of the price would fall yeah, yeah. Yes. well if you th if you think about people who believe um wholeheartedly the the tesla futurism hype and you made a venn, venn diagram of them with people who are interested in cryptocurrencies i think there'd be a reasonable overlap yeah um but anyway that's just my opinion uh but with that um we have reached the finish line oh. and i want to say thank you steve pleasure and thank you matt it's been fun and thanks to our Lord of all things technical, social solutionist and head of out of touch, Mr. Pritchard, for his deft orchestration of the production process. Today, he's wearing a T-shirt saying, my job is top secret. Even I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, Persia 206 HDI pants, which oh. are amazing. You have got to see them. People on YouTube will be seeing them right now. Amazing. And spring shoes. Um, actually, I think they more, look more like coilovers. Um, on the shoes there. Incredible. Um, let us know your thoughts. You can find Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. If you're an Apple podcast listener, please rate and review us. Um, and remember, you can also watch us on YouTube. And if you are already, make sure you subscribe to the Cars Guide YouTube channel uh, so you can stay on top of all our latest content. But before we go, Sadly, um, attended a funeral earlier in the week uh, and felt particularly uncomfortable driving into the cemetery uh, as the GPS blurted out, you have reached your final destination. <laughs> uh, uh, uh.